So on this week's episode of the podcast, we talked about the new studio that we're building uh, here at our downtown location, and we are standing in our downtown location. We are indeed. Here it is. We are uh, in the control room uh, section right now. Uh, it's definitely a work in progress. We wanted to take you on a quick tour uh, of the studio and also uh, walk through installing and configuring an Axia power station today for this control room. Let's go look around and see what we've got. Sounds good. So the heart of this uh, radio for TV studio is built around the TriCaster 8000 series switcher along with a Blackmagic uh, 20 by 20 video hub router. All the studio lighting in this room is uh, DMX controllable. Uh, we can change color shades on the table and intensity of the overhead lighting. So now we're actually standing inside the studio itself. Uh, I'm standing at what will be the host position. We have two Axia consoles, one console technically that's split. Um, in front of the host, we'll have a workstation computer for internet browsing and then our um, radio automation system, in our case Wide Orbit, will be on this touch screen here. We went with the newer Axia Fusion console in here and we went with a split frame with the idea that because of the way the desktop was laid out, we needed to keep everything uh, hidden by this front uh, mask. Yeah. Uh, we needed a place to drop the monitors in the middle, uh, so it forced us to push the, the consoles out to the side. We think it's going to work out just fine. We're still in the process of mounting things, so the monitors won't be this high, obviously. Um, they'll be recessed and not visible to the cameras. We selected Heil PR40 microphones in the chrome-plated version uh, on these low-profile mic arms uh, that will come out for both the host and all three guest positions, uh, just for a better look on camera and to keep things out of, uh, out of the lines of sight. The front of this furniture is really kind of cool. We've got five monitors stretched across, and the monitors will act as one pixel space, so we could stretch an image all the way across, or we can split them up and show individual images on each monitor. They're sitting on, uh, on kind of a translucent plexiglass material, and we have LED color bars behind, so we can make the set any color that we want, uh, and again, that's all DMX controllable along with the studio lights in the ceiling. So the lighting that we have in the ceiling attached to our speed rail are the ICANN LED 500 AL fixtures. Uh, they're extremely slim, low profile, have a touch screen on the back, they're DMX controllable, but you don't have to use DMX. Really a nice fixture, especially for this environment that has kind of a lower ceiling. Uh, it's been really good for this space. All right, so now we've shown you all the goodies that we're installing in this studio. But we know that you all want to see, how do you do radio in this TV studio? How do we do that? Well, it's kind of interesting. We talked about the split um, fusion console from Axie that we have in here. And all of our cabling between this room and the control room where the power station is going to live, all of our network gear, basically all rack mount gear lives next door in the control room, is run through a conduit that were drilled through the floor, under the floor, and then up in the other studio. So we've got, I don't know, what do you say, seven or eight runs of CAT6 coming in and out. A lot of it's backup, kind of redundancy things. But the... Um, the real magic here is this uh, CAN bus cable from Axia. And if you're not familiar with CAN bus, it's basically, it's a pretty simple copper cable, like three pair uh, cable that has uh, power and also just some very simple protocol, a control uh, protocol language that travels across it, how the console talks to the engine. So we ordered a custom 40 foot version from Axia to run between this room and that room. And so uh, what we're gonna do now is go to the control room. Uh, we're gonna plug directly in with an ethernet cable to the power station and show you from the ground up how we uh, address and configure a brand new power station out of the box. So now we're gonna go ahead and configure a brand new power station. Uh, and to do that, we had to come into the control room because for the first configuration, we have to plug directly in to the power station. It comes shipped from Axia with a default IP address of 192.168.2.50. Uh, many of you know this already, but we're, uh, we need to plug it into our computer directly and then set up our computer on, a, on the same subnet um, as that is. So I'm going to go to my uh, Ethernet settings. We're doing this on a Mac, but obviously you can do the same thing on Windows. Uh, slightly different method to do so, but sure. chances are you already know how to do that. 
So I gave it an IP address of 192.168.2.200 and a subnet mask of 255.255.250. A uh, funny little caveat that you should pay attention to, don't add a default gateway uh, when you set this up. In our case, 192.168.2.50 is an actual IP address on our network, so if you had your Wi-Fi on or something like that, that could cause some conflicts. Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, we'll go ahead and navigate to 192.168.2.50 and we see the default um, control center here for the power station. And we're gonna go to the setup uh, section, which is the first one down. It'll prompt you for username and password. The default is user with no password on all Axia devices. So here's where we get to the heart of the matter, where we can assign an IP address, uh, subnet, and a default gateway for this device. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. um, but before I do, I want to flip through a couple of things real quick as a fail-safe type thing. Yes. I want to come on down here uh, into the uh, mix engine settings and the program and mon out settings. And I want to change some channel numbers before I decide to put this thing on the Axia network. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the podcast uh, that was just released this past week, but IP addressing and channel numbers in an IP audio environment is so critical. Critical. Duplicates are bad will destroy your world and also eat your face. So it is, well, I mean, they will, it's bad. It's true, it's true. So I'm going to refer real quickly to the master IP address document, which of course I don't have a tab for in there, so don't look at my Facebook. Okay, oh, IP address document. Oh, oh I turned my <laughs> Wi-Fi off. There's a lot of bad things happening here. <laughs> I'm gonna to refer to uh, a Google doc that we have here, which is the master IP address document for our company. We will show our camera during this time mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of things in here that I don't necessarily need the world to you see. You can't see this. This is bad things, but it basically outlines all of our devices. I've, I've predetermined a Spruce Street address. We decided this is gonna be Studio 12. So this the power station is gonna be 121. So all of our sources, what that means for us, if you heard in the podcast, this IP address is gonna be 10.0.3.121. That means all of our source numbers for this power station are gonna start with the numbers 121. So literally, program one out of this thing is going to be 1211. 1212, 1213. And the reason we have to separate these is if you end up with duplicate channel numbers, um, it creates all kind of havoc on the network. Things end up where they're not supposed to be. Um, bad things. Very important. And like we mentioned in the podcast, you can uh, refer to our website at the radiotechguys.com and grab our IP addressing and channel uh, configuration template. Uh, we have an Excel sheet up there available for you to help you plan these things. So I'm almost done with this. You'll notice that I went into the one, two, twos here, and this happens in every studio that has a power station because it has too many internal IOs to fit in 10 numerals, but it's fine because the IP address 122 is reserved in this power station as well. There won't be any conflicts on our network uh, with those channel numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. The other place we need to check uh, before we turn this thing on is down in the IO subsystems main section. The source is here, the same username and password applied. No password, default is user. Uh, we need to, this, is already, this has already been configured because this was at one point a studio that we'd used. Uh, so we yes. need to double check vMixes and everything yes. in this case to make sure there's no conflicts. But this will be one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, six, three, seven, one, two, three, eight. Thank you, and I'll go ahead and disable all of these sources as well uh, because we, we don't need them to come up when we first turn on the power station. We'll worry about renaming them and everything later. And we wanna check the vMixes to make sure they're all disabled. And they are. They're disabled. So at this point, um, I think we're safe to go ahead and um, I think we're safe to go ahead and change the IP address and connect this to our network yep. without too much risk. So let's go ahead back to the setup tab where we were originally. 
and change this to 10.0.3. Dot something. What did we say it was? 121. 10.0.3.121. And the gateway is 10.0.3.250. And as soon as I hit submit, I'm going to lose uh, connectivity to this. Now that we've assigned the IP address, we can go ahead and connect it uh, to our live wire network and then control it from anywhere. So um, we'll jump back on uh, from the actual studio and Alex will continue the configuration of the power station when we get back in there. Sounds good. Check out the part two video here on YouTube for more power station configuration.